Hello. Hello everyone. Welcome, welcome to our fall seminar series. And we are here to talk about uh, what? What are we talking about today? Anybody? So the topic is behind me and uh, it's a pretty serious topic because I can see a lot of these kids, they are, they are here with a lot of uh, focus, determination, resolve to get into some of the good schools. And uh, you know, there are some uh, secrets that hopefully our college counselors will share today as we run through the afternoon. And uh, the, we actually had a very similar seminar uh, just a few months ago. This was uh, in the uh, month of, uh, I think it was January. And uh, that was sort of a precursor to this one. This one we have packed the room. And there's a little bit of interest in the one that we did earlier this year. But uh, we had almost 200 RSVPs for this one. So people from all, all parts of the Bay Area are, are here. How many, how many from Saratoga? Okay. And how many juniors today? How many juniors? Okay. Very few juniors. How many seniors? Okay, so it looks like the juniors and seniors are already busy applying for colleges. <laughs> Not too many are out here today. Now, apart from uh, this uh, college app seminar, we run a variety of different things here. And I'm going to run through it real quick. We also run uh, something called Silicon Valley Coders Club that provides uh, kids. And these are primarily middle school kids, the opportunity to do coding. And they meet here every Sunday at uh, 4 o'clock. And how many, any kids participating in the Silicon Valley Coders Club today? Any? There are a few. There are a few on, who are not raising their hand. Okay. So, and how about the Debate Academy, which is uh, conducted in, uh, right here at 4 o'clock. The Debate Academy. And then all these programs are, are offered for free, for no charge. And uh, they are run by the youth of our community. And, uh, the, for example, if you look at the Silicon Valley Coders Club, it's been run in six different locations, including Livermore, San Jose, uh, Dinuba in Central California, and East Palo Alto, and many other locations. And it's totally offered for free. So it's basically an opportunity for us to engage our kids. Because if I look at our Silicon Valley kids, they're already pretty smart, they're very bright. They end up in some of the very good schools. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, by sheer uh, draw of the DNA that they have or sometimes it's uh, because these kids are super smart and they are engaged and they are figuring out the process. But what would happen if we provided them some, a little bit of the insights, insights of what it takes to apply for college and how do you write a good compelling essay and things like that. So that is the intention because uh, you know, many of our kids, they actually get college counselors and many who don't. And, uh, I think the success is there on both sides, you know, whether you get a college counselor or not. But just having that initial uh, perspective of what it takes to apply to colleges, how do you set up a good college application, what are college counselors looking for, you know, that would probably be helpful. And that's the reason why we're planning to run this twice a year, one in early uh, spring, and then we'll run it in fall. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll get going. So I'm going to walk through a little bit of the format of how we will walk through our sessions today. So we have five amazing college counselors. You will get to hear from them in terms of what their background is and uh, how they work with these kids and students. And we'll have each of them walk through a, a panel presentation. They will actually, there are topics that they have picked beforehand that is hopefully it's not there anymore. But uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll walk through, uh, we'll have them walk through uh, their presentations. And some of them have PowerPoint, some of them don't. And uh, we'll have them seated here in just a couple of minutes. And then after they are done with that, each, each presentation is seven minutes long. And we have a timer. Mr. Timer, raise your hand. That's uh, Siva. Siva has got the timer. And, uh, and when you, you are out of time, he's going to flash a stop sign. And we would I'd like to see if we can hopefully stop at that point. Because we have a pretty tight agenda we would like to run through. So after about 35 minutes of uh, presentations from, uh, from our five counselors, we will actually do a little Q&A. And uh, we'll have a few volunteers walking around uh, collecting questions from you. And we'll have three by five cards, we'll give you pens. So think of the questions you would like to have, uh, that you would like to pose to our uh, counselors. And we'll gather the questions. And so we'll run the Q&A for about 35, 40 minutes. 
and then uh, we'll do a little lottery. And that lottery will provide you an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one counseling with one of the five college counselors. And how will we do that? So as you, as you, uh, you have an opportunity to preview these counselors in terms of uh, how their methodology, their process, the framework that they bring to the table, and figure out which of these counselors appeals to you. And, and uh, you will basically go out and put their name uh, and your name that I would like to have a one-on-one -on -one counseling session with this particular counselor. Now, it really depends as to how that allocation happens because at the end, we'll pick out 25 names and depending on slots that are labeled, right? So let's say the first five want to go to one of them, then that slot is all gone. We'll send you to the next one, right? So it's a little bit of how we pick, uh, pick these names up. So we, uh, 25 will get priority compared to everyone else. The remaining who do not get picked will still have an opportunity to go through the counseling. The only thing is you will have to stand in line, you'll have to wait. And after these five are done, you will have an opportunity to go, go out and meet some of these folks. And if you would like to provide your contact information to our college counselors, you are welcome to do that as well. And you can arrange an offline meeting. So you have different opportunities. Either you can meet up here today with them or you can actually meet offline. It's totally your call. But we will actually start shutting down exactly two hours from now, about 5.10. So at 5.10, we will start vacating the room. So our one-on-one -on -one college uh, counseling sessions will, uh, will finish at around 5.10. Any questions before we get going? Okay, so what I'll do is I'll invite our college counselors. I would like to start with uh, John Sai. Come on, come on up here and uh, thank you for your applause. Then we will uh, Sherry Shusum. And uh, Pam Berico. Then we have Kubi Modi. Okay, and who is presenting? So we'll, we'll do a swap. If uh, we have somebody who's presenting, and uh, Robert is presenting, John is doing Q and A. Okay, super. So we'll bring John back for the Q and A, and we'll have Robert sit down. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And uh, at this point, I think we have the presentations loaded. I think one of our uh, counselors uh, is going to just walk through. Does not have a presentation, which is perfectly okay. Any questions uh, before we get started? Okay. They are in the hot seat here, so you need to give them one more applause. It, it's a high pressure situation here, but, but, yes. Yes, that's why I always bring my wife along with me. You know. so, but nothing like the pressure cooker situation that these juniors and seniors are here, right? So, they, they have a little pressure, but nothing like that. So, and finally, we have Priya Balur. And, and Priya has been volunteering her time with, uh, with our community for almost like two years. So it's been great to have her thought leadership, guiding these kids, mentoring these kids. And she has provided incredible impact to many of these kids. So thank you all for joining. And uh, at this point, I'm done. I'm going to give it to uh, Robert and we'll get going. I'm going to load the deck and we'll get started. And and, uh, you know, we were planning to introduce them, but uh, what we'll do is, you have seven minutes, you have about 30 seconds of introduction, and then we can start with the day. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today on Sunday, taking time out of your weekend to join us here. My name is Robert Thompson, and I'm a counselor at Flex College Prep. Um, while he's loading up the deck, we'll do just a quick background on me. I grew up in the Bay Area, local boy, went to Archbishop Mitty High School, spent two years at UC Santa Barbara, transferred to Santa Clara, graduated with my um, undergraduate degree, and I'm currently getting my master's in counseling psychology at Santa Clara right now while working at Flex as a counselor. Um, so today, and thank you. Today we'll be talking about uses and pilots, navigating the differences between them, and pretty much talking about what are the differences, what are the similarities, and how are these going to apply for your students specifically. So when we get started here, Okay, so the biggest difference between uses and privates 
One of them is going to be cost. So you can see Stanford, we're going to be comparing Stanford and UC Berkeley here. Stanford, three times as much, and comparing it to the CSU, Stanford's going to be about eight times as much. Um, but you'll notice that uh, room and board and other book fees are going to be roughly the same, about fifteen dollars to $18,000 a year. <laughs> so some other differences between the school systems will be the size of the university. Um, Berkeley is going to be about 27,000 undergraduates, Stanford has about 7,000, and for the most part you'll find that UCs um, and the state schools as well, CSUs, and out-of-states as well, will have slightly larger populations. Um, the number of majors offered at those um, state schools are also going to be a lot larger. Berkeley offers 277 undergraduate majors, Stanford just has 101. So if students want to go into something specialized, they're going to have to go towards the UCs. But Stanford has fantastic majors as well. Let's see if this works. Okay, you also notice between the two that the total student, the total student population is going to include the graduate students. So Berkeley's got about 10,000, Stanford's also got about 10,000. So Stanford's focus is going to be a little bit separate there. That's just fun. Okay, demographics between the schools are also going to be slightly different. Um, you will tend to find that at state schools, the demographics of the state are going to be more equally represented. Um, you can see UC Berkeley, um, Asian Pacific Islander is a little bit higher than you'd find in California, um, but it's going to be slightly more accurate to California than Stanford and private are going to be in general. Okay, so the admission process between these schools are also going to be a little bit different. All schools are going to be considering a bunch of soft factors and hard factors. So hard factors are going to be your GPA, SAT scores, ACT scores. Um, APs, the rigor of your courses in general, are going to be very important, and among those, GPA is always going to be the most important. And essentially what these colleges are looking for, when you're giving them your GPA, giving them your SAT score, is can you handle the rigor of our courses freshman year? One of the most important things for colleges is going to be freshman retention rate, and ultimately for your graduation rate. If they can select students that will be able to thrive in classes and continue on sophomore year, and junior, senior year, and graduating four years, they'll be higher ranked in four years. And this is something that colleges are going to be very, very interested in. Okay, so as far as non-academics, the most important ones up here are going to be college essays, extracurricular activities, and leadership positions. Um, private schools are also going to look at legacy. Um, diversity and identity can be very important for these schools as well. Um, but extracurricular profile is how well you can differentiate yourself outside of the classroom, how well you can show your passion, and how high of an achiever you can be. Are you competing at the state level, the national level, or perhaps the international level? And being able to get those levels of recognition will separate you from other students in your class. Um, the non-academic factors are very important in general because among 400 students applying from your schools to UC Berkeley, say, they're not going to be able to take everybody, and many will have very similar GPAs, many similar SAT scores. So those extracurricular activities and this year in particular, the college essays are going to have a really big impact on the admission process. So the UCs in general, GPA is going to be the most important factor, as is for most schools. Um, test scores are going to be next, and then college essays and extracurriculars are going to be the last 30% or so. Last year, Berkeley, Irvine, and Los Angeles were putting the college essays as equal to the SAT scores. So we're likely going to see that trend to continue this year. Perhaps Santa Barbara and Davis and Irvine, or Davis will be continuing with that trend. On the private side, GPA is going to be the most important, but test scores are going to be a little bit less important, and a greater emphasis on the essays, on the extracurricular activities. Colleges here are very interested in what students are going to be bringing to the university, and they're interested to see if students will fit the mission of the school, if students will bring to campus the qualities of students that they're looking to bring. Um, this is very important for students when you're researching which schools. How many are thinking of applying to Stanford? Just one? Two? Okay. Excellent. So uh, when you're looking at Stanford, when you're looking at, say, Santa Clara, Santa Clara is looking for Jesuit values, students that are interested in helping their communities 
at home locally, but also abroad. They're interested in students who are compassionate and generous. So those types of qualities, if you can demonstrate them in your extracurricular activities through community service, or if you can demonstrate them in your college essays, then that's going to give you a higher percent chance of resonating with the admissions officer that's reading your profile. Now, all schools are going to have this holistic review. Um, for privates, this has been the case for the last century or so. For the UCs, this is more of a recent trend. Um, when I was applying for the UCs in the mid-2000s, it was just SAT scores, ACT, write a couple of lame essays, and you get in. But now the essays are becoming increasingly important, and these schools are trying to identify students that are going to be able to actually match the culture of their particular university. Um, last year, UCLA had 119,000 applications, which is a lot, and they have so many to choose from. Um, with just about four or 5,000 freshmen starting that year, they're able to get, um, be able to sift through those applications and find students that have qualities that UCLA, that UC Berkeley are looking for. Okay, so in the top 50 schools, there are 35 privates. And there are also 15 public schools, and amongst those, six of the UCs, um, Berkeley, LA, and Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is actually above San Diego this year, which is a new cool thing. That was for my first two years. Um, but as you can see here, um, the trends on the left are from 2014 and then 2015. Um, so you can see that Berkeley, LA, Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, Rivers, Hyperset are all getting more and more competitive. Now, this is just about 1.5%, but if you have 100,000 applications, that's going to be 2,000 more students who are not getting in each and every year compared to the last. So that's 2,000 students, perhaps from Saratoga and from other local schools, that are not going to get in because they're just not quite competitive enough. On the private side, more and more competitive. Stanford's at 4.7 last year, um, and you can see the Ivies are all under 10%. So this is going to be extremely competitive condition, admissions, um, and it's very important to be able to identify the process schools that are going to fit your profile, schools that are going to fit your personality, and apply to schools that will resonate with you. Um, we have passed out folders, so please take a look through those. Flex is having open houses in the next month or so, and we also have workshop evaluation forms that we'd love you to fill out. Um, any feedback you have on the presentation, on the answers to our questions we have, and of course, um, to meet with us later today. So thank you very much. So that was Robert kicked it off. Uh, thank you for getting this going for us. Good presentation. And I did want to uh, shout out to Sandhya Balakrishnan. She's part of Flex. And she's been very engaged in our community. You know, she was guiding students uh, in the past. Her kids actually passed out through Saratoga High School. And uh, it's actually one of the reasons why we have this, uh, because it was Sandhya's idea that we need to provide this opportunity for the kids of our community. So let's give it, give it up for Sandhya. Now, I see that many of you are taking pictures, and you, you can if you would like to, but the, all these decks, we have them here, will be loaded up on uh, SlideShare, and if you signed up, uh, we will send you information about uh, how you can access it, plus the video. The video session today has been captured, and you get a chance to watch it again and again if you would like to. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry. Let's give it up for Sherry. especially my seniors in the room. Um, my name is Cherie Shessel, and I have been a college counselor in a public school setting for 11 years. This is my 11th year. Um, I got to spend eight wonderful years at Monta Vista, a school right around the corner. Um, and I'm here with UC Easy, uh, really to help uh, hopefully answer some questions that you guys have about the college process. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to spend a little time just introducing the company of UC Easy. It stands for Universities and Colleges Made Easy, so we don't just get students into UCs and CSUs, although we, we do that often, um, but we're really representing all of the colleges uh, kind of in the states. So we're really at the heart of us a social company, and I think that's what drew me in initially for UC Easy. Um, I work now at a very underprivileged, underrepresented high school, um, and we offer free applications, web-based applications for my students that really can't afford kind of the one-on-one -on -one private counseling um, that we are going to talk about today. Um, so outside of that, we have uh, web-based learning, and we have many webinars. 
that we do starting from students, um, topics that begin in ninth grade, taking you all the way through senior year, financial aid and all of that stuff. Um, but then really what we're here to talk about today is the individual uh, uh, counseling services that we provide students, the coaching that we give families uh, working one-on-one -on -one to get through <laughs> the process of high school and, and college uh, application season. Um, so really for me, private counseling one-on-one -on -one with families is not about getting 4.5 kids into Harvard, although we do that every year. Um, it's about individualizing the process um, and I've heard it said already a couple of times now that it's, it's getting more competitive. So looking at how to stand out and, and showcase your true self. I don't have a slide deck with me, so you're gonna have to bear with me, but today I want to talk about uh, getting, pro getting the process started early and the advantages of starting this, um, this whole insanity. Uh, the earlier, the better. So really, why, why do we think that you guys should start early? Um, raise your hand if you're juniors or seniors. Awesome, for the juniors and seniors in here, how many of you have things that you already regret about freshman and sophomore year? Dang, if I would've known this, I would've done this differently. Yeah, anybody, no regrets? Yeah, and parents too shaking your head. If I would've known this about the process or what's to come, I would've tweaked it a little bit um, to kind of fit my needs or um, fit the needs of my kid who is planning to do this. And if I would have known this ahead of time, I would have done this differently. So that's really um, an important piece of the college process is getting uh, started early so we can strategize in the best way uh, to really showcase and bring the best you to the college application process when that kind of time comes. So um, really also I found that when students, when we get students early, we're able to set clear and achievable goals. So then this process of high school becomes a little less tedious. So when I hear kids complaining, oh my chem honors is horrible, I'm doing this and that, it feels so tedious, I'm not learning anything. We're saying focus on the goal. What's your goal here? Let's focus on the goal. So it makes the journey of getting through high school and our ultimate goal of raising a successful child, even to get past college, um, it makes it a little bit more um, achievable and understandable. So what would I do with you if I got you early? And I think uh, the rest of the table would agree. Um, we get to talk about uh, course selection. So even starting from summer before high school starts, strategizing um, how to maximize your time in high school. You only get seven periods a year, and our discussion begins with how can we maximize every, um, every uh, class that we get to take and how can we direct that towards college admission um, and maximize your learning. Also, we get to talk about standardized testing. Um, it's insane the changes and stuff that happened within one year. Um, and to follow that, you really have to devote a full-time job uh, to, to really understand and know, when do I take this? When do I take that? Do I take this or do I take that? Um, and at what point are we gonna maximize your time so we're not just throwing all the tests at you, that we're doing it efficiently so you're able to focus more on what is gonna serve you best. Also, we get to explore majors. Um, and career options with you if we get you early. So I know it sounds crazy, but my five-year-old has taken college tours with me. We talk about majors every day, and people think I'm joking when I say that, um, but it's really never too early to start. So I have my daughter talking about UCLA. Uh, her uncle and aunt work there, so that's a little bit of a cheat, but we get to have these conversations so we can focus in on what is to come, and it's supposed to be exciting. A lot of times I see students, juniors and seniors especially, sitting in front of me, nervous and anxious and not looking forward to this college process. This is supposed to be fun. And if you're able to um, make it like that and start early, I see a kid saying, no, it's not fun. Um, then it, this is a more enjoyable process for the whole family. Also, we get to do things like maximizing your time that you're spending um, over the summer and any free time that you have. If we're starting early enough, we're able to look, project out uh, what free time you're gonna have and how you're gonna use it strategically to really maximize, again, who you are, showcasing who you are, saying this is what I'm passionate about. How can I turn that into something that's gonna show um, my passion uh, for, what, for what my activity may be? 
Um, also, this gives us an opportunity, starting early, to dive deeper into activities that are most meaningful. I think the, the fault I see with ninth and 10th graders is spreading themselves too thin. So not really having an emphasis on something important, maybe uh, that's most meaningful to them, but instead trying to do everything. So what clubs are you in? And then they name 10 clubs. And what sports do you play? And then they name four sports. And I'm like, oh good lord, how are we doing our homework? Uh, so looking at what, is, what activities are most important to you and how can we dive deeper into them? Because when colleges are looking at your applications, they want to see passion for your activities, passion for what you're doing outside of the classroom, and of course inside the classroom, but they want, to sh they want to see that. And the way to do that is really starting early in the ninth grade and looking at the most meaningful um, activities and, and how that turns back into you and shows who you are. So really, I think the, the advantage and, and why I'm here working one-on-one -on -one with families is developing, starting early will help you develop a relationship with the person that you're working with. So when I'm working with someone for the first time as a senior, we're getting right in there. So they, when I see their essays and I give them back the kind of feedback and they're like, oh my goodness, who's this person giving me this feedback? If I'm able to start in as a ninth grader, develop really a trusting relationship and rapport with the student and the family, uh, we're able to dig in deeper once the really important time comes of college applications, uh, me destroying your essays, and me telling you yes or no to certain situations. Um, I'm not that mean, don't get scared, everyone looks so <laughs> serious out there. Um, but yeah, so that's, there's lots of advantages, I hope you can see that from starting early, starting the process early. Um, thank you guys for your time, and I'm excited to talk to you guys a little bit more. Thank you, and uh, what we heard from this uh, chair's presentation, I think she talked about passion and focus, key takeaways, right? So as you listen to these uh, insights, you know, hopefully you're, you're thinking, you know, as your, your kids are probably thinking, and when you have questions that come up, you know, we have a team of volunteers, Taina back there, Taina, uh, and then uh, Seema back there, and then we have uh, Taina's son. So there'll be a few of us who will be walking around, uh, and we have three by five cards with pens. So just raise your hand, draw attention to them, and write a question, and then hopefully it will be addressed in the Q&A section following this one. Sounds like a good plan? Okay. And, uh, and at this point, oh, one more thing. I would like to invite uh, Nisha Stana to come in and talk about uh, Mentor. Okay. And uh, there are a few sponsors that have enabled this event. You know, we are bringing this uh, for no charge. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, and I'd like to give the stage uh, to Nish for a few minutes, and if you don't mind sharing the microphone, yes. Come on up here, Nish. Yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nish, and uh, I, I am from the company called Mentor. Um, before I introduce, I just have a question for the parents here. Um, how many parents feel that when you tell your kids to do something, they actually value their advice of their friends more than they value your advice. All right. I see a few hands and some people are embarrassed, that's fine. Um, and then, um, how many kids are actually spending more time messaging and chatting with, with their friends more than they are actually uh, spending on filling the college apps? Right? So, so we saw this trend in teens um, that you know, most teen teenagers uh, you know, listen to their peers more than they listen to their own parents. Um, and they are not very serious about college until their friends or their peers or people who are almost of their same age tell about them. So we created a platform called Mentor. Mentor is a platform, it's a mobile app, which basically allows high schoolers to connect with college students who are actually in college right now uh, and, and have a one-on-one -on -one session online uh, to get college advice. We have more than uh, 250 students from all IVs, UCs, and top 50 colleges. And high schoolers are spending uh, you know, a lot of time on this app because it's so easy that we have made um, getting advice from college students just by the means of the chat. So they, they chat with these college students and get advice. That is completely free right now. And uh, just to let you know, uh, the kind of uh, advice that these students are getting are, are uh, college essays and also about SATs, ACTs, 
but the, the main thing is that they are getting for their peers, so they are actually taking, uh, making it much more valuable uh, for their own self uh, than coming from, you know, maybe maybe uh, somebody, uh, maybe parent or older. So the app is called Mentor, M-E-N-T-R, Mentor without the O, and we have some flyers, we give the flyers, download it, it's free to, it's free to install and free to uh, start chatting with college students, and good luck with everyone for the college apps. Thank you. So when uh, somebody, they have to download the app and uh, they actually uh, power up the app and they are basically asking a question, who responds back to the question? Is there a robot at the back end? No, so... Is there a search engine at the back end? What is going on? Very good question. So now we are in Silicon Valley, everybody is talking about artificial intelligence. And I'm the most artificial intelligent guy in this whole, whole valley, so, you know. So there are actually mentors who are on this app responding. So we have students from, from all the universities like Harvard, MIT, Yale, UCs, Berkeley. So they are they are on the app and as soon as you start a session, uh, they, they get a notification that, hey, somebody wants to start uh, chatting with you. And then they come on, on the app and they start chatting. So it's like having a, 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 a session uh, with your friend. And then there are, they, I'm one of the guys who actually, uh, you know, uh, respond to a lot of requests. I ask them, hey, what, is there any specific college you're looking for or anything else? And when they tell, hey, I'm looking for robotics. So I look for the mentors who are in robotics across all the colleges and, and basically um, recommend them. One, one uh, thing just to let you know how they're different from others is that there was one student uh, who, who wanted to apply to, UB, uh, to LA colleges like USC, UCLA. And he reached out to five students from uh, those colleges asking about one thing. What is the air quality of uh, LA because he has asthma? So can he actually survive four years in, in Los Angeles if he wants to do that? There is nobody, Google does not have all the answers. Mentor has. Thank you. So one more question, Neesh, before you go. Yes. What is the best time of the day to ask questions? These kids are signing up and you know, what's the best time? Like midnight, morning? So the best answers will be given by these parents. So, so basically, uh, these kids are actually night hawkers, right? They're working at nights. But there is, it's an app. As long as you, you can download this app and then you can start chatting at any time, uh, you know, across, across all the time zones. And we have people from other countries also who are basically getting advice, like from India and China. So this is all over the globe and there is no time restrictions. All you have to do is download and start chatting with the mentors. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Nish, and uh, appreciate it. By the way, I just want to say, uh, Rishi and Seema, uh, you've been doing an awesome job. This is this is a platform that you know uh, people like us crave for. So I would really appreciate if everybody can give me a, a give a good applause to Rishi and Seema. It's, they have been doing this um, an awesome job, and I just love uh, when they have host these events. Thank you. Thank you, Nish, and we would love to have the microphone back. <laughs> yes. Okay. And uh, we have uh, the presentation loaded for Pam. Hi, my name is Pam Maragon with Compass to College, and we offer a full range of college admissions counseling services, but I'm here today to talk to you about writing essays. Yes? Okay. I'm here today to talk to you about writing essays, and I'm sorry if I'm talking fast, I have seven minutes here. Uh, why me? Well, I have a 25 or more years experience as an editor and a writer. And for the past five years, I've been working at Stanford University as an editor for a student-run and student-written newsletter. And I'm also a co-instructor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. So I've had a lot of opportunity to work with students at a number of different levels in terms of improving their writing capabilities and helping them write not only journalistic articles, but also standout essays. Uh, as you've heard already, the essay is really more like the icing on the cake. That's why it's so important, because when grades, SAT scores, activities, and recommendations kind of meet a baseline for a lot of the premier universities, how do they tell who goes to the college or the university? It's the essay. So it really is getting more and more important. Most colleges, what, you know, what is it like to be an admissions reader in most colleges? Well, uh, it's a pretty grueling job. Most colleges, especially premier colleges, are getting 20 to 30,000 applications. As you heard, uh, the UC system gets even more than that. Stanford had 44,000 applications last year. Most of these have similar academic profiles. 
The readers see 30 to 40 applications a day that they, that they review in whole, and that means about 30 minutes per application and about three minutes per essay. So if your essay isn't compelling, if your essay isn't engaging, if your essay doesn't stand out, you don't stand out. If you look at uh, what colleges are looking for right now, uh, MIT has a brochure they'll send you if you ask them about applications. And it says basically, we're looking to put together a team of about 2,000 people to climb a very tall mountain. And what that means is that they want people from a variety of backgrounds. They want diversity. They want top people, but they also want people who will make the educational experience um, good for their fellow classmates. So as an entering freshman, you are as much a part of the university or college experience for the school you go to as the teachers, the courses, the institution itself. So schools are really looking to see how you fit in, as you've heard, but also how you're going to enrich the educational experience for the other students who are there. And that's something that comes out through your essays. Why? Because you're going to show them what you value, what's important to you, what you've done, what you're excited and passionate about. And you're hearing a lot about passion today, I know. Um, how can you succeed at writing an effective essay? This is a big topic and probably could take for a whole seminar, if not more, and I do spend hours and hours with students sometimes helping them perfect their essays, but I'm going to give you a crash course. So first, think about what excites you. What about you is unique? Because this is what colleges are looking for. What about you? Everybody is unique. Everybody is an individual. What about you is different? What about you is unique? How does your perception of the world, how you view things, differ? What brings meaning and significance into your life? How have events shaped your life? And the way you look at the world and your intellectual vitality? These are all questions to start asking yourself to help yourself choose a topic or something that you really want to write about. Because the more passionate and involved you are in the subject, the better the essay is going to be. One thing you can do is consider about writing, whoops, consider writing about one of your activities or accomplishments. Say why it's important to you, why you're committed to it, what it's meant to you, why you're interested in it, and share that with the readers. A lot of times people tell you that you have to tell a story. If you're involved in marketing at all, especially here in the Silicon Valley, this is what you hear, everybody, everybody has to tell a story. Right? And that's great, but you don't have to tell a story to write a compelling essay. All you have to do is talk about something that's incredibly meaningful to you and talk about it in a way that's going to pull the reader in in three minutes so that they understand who you are and what you value. Um, once you've got some topics that you want to write about or you're thinking about writing about, once you've got some ideas, Discuss it with a good listener. Discuss it with somebody who knows you particularly well. Ask them, does this sound like me? Does this reflect me? Uh, find examples to support it. Ways that you can talk about what you are passionate about. And maybe that's where stories come in, because if you say, I'm passionate about a sport, think about instances of, with that sport or things that have happened. They'll help you write about it. Think about the, what the essay means. Reflect. One of the other things that universities like to see in essays is a lot of reflection. They want to know where you've come from, what you've learned, and what you're going to, what you bring with you to the college experience. So how do I take all of that background and everything that's happened in my life and bring it forward so that I can share it with the people I'm going to school with? Finally, a few don'ts here. Um, don't repeat information from your application. It's already there. They don't need to see anything about the school, the courses you've taken, the sports you're involved in, the specifics on the activities that you've done. That's there for them already. Don't write a travel log. A lot of students get very passionate about traveling and foreign travel, and a lot of college, uh, high schools have uh, programs, community service programs, where you can go travel to third world countries, for example, and do some volunteer work. Don't write a travel log. It's, um, it's not a good approach. It's not unique. Don't forget to check for typos and grammar mistakes. Don't use cliches. Don't answer the questions as they are posed. 
as in what is your favorite subject, my favorite subject is. Don't use gimmicks in favorite quotes. For heaven's sake, don't wear out the thesaurus. This has to sound like you, so don't go rifling through a thesaurus to see if you can find big, important sounding words. It needs to sound like you. And don't try to use the same essay for every school because every school is different, and as you've heard already, every school is looking for a student profile that matches their school. So you can't just cookie cutter one from the, to the other. And uh, a final don't that isn't up there is don't wait too late. If you know any seniors right now, they're probably scrambling about essays because now is the time. So don't wait too late. And my stop sign is on, so um, thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to speaking with some of you after the program. Thank you, Pan. And uh, like Pan said, it's all about the persona. Your persona has to come out through the essays. And if you can do that, that will be a very, very effective essay. And uh, at this point, we'll turn it over to, uh, to Poobie. And uh, let me bring up her, Poobie's deck. Uh, Poobie is from uh, Inside Education. I'm going to run it for you. And uh, you're on, Poobie. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday afternoon. To introduce myself very quickly, my name is Pervy. I grew up in the Bay Area. I went to UCLA for my undergrad, and then I went to Stanford for a graduate degree in education, and then I did my MBA there. I have spent my entire professional career in college admissions, have been working with students for a very long time. I am one of the co-owners of Insight Education. We've been around since 1999, working with kids not only in the Bay Area, we work with kids um, across states and have tons of kids actually internationally. We have a very different focus on we have a very different focus on how we work with our kids. Our belief is that high school is not just a journey to college. High school are four, pre presents four very important years for your life development, and that's how colleges also look at that. So today I'm going to talk about some factors that are rarely talked about in the admissions process, but actually very important. Before we do that, we're going to play a game. So we're going to play a game, starting with, and we're going to, I'm going to run through a case study. And I want some feedback as we're kind of going through this, and then I'm going to talk about some factors. So I am presenting here a student. She is a future investment banker. She goes to a very competitive pu uh, public high school has done relatively well in school, has gotten two Bs, so a 3.88 GPA. Um, on her testing, it that rounds out to a 4.18 UC weighted GPA. Her test scores are a 2,000, this is when it was on the old scale, of course. And she really did well in the math, struggled with critical reading and writing, but you know what, at a certain point, we decided, stop testing. This is it, You're, the more time you spend on testing, the less time you have for other things. She was very happy with that decision. Took a couple of subject tests, US history, chemistry, and bio, and her scores were there. Also had her AP exams, English, history, government, economics, and she did really well on those, got a combination of fours and fives. So that's some pretty basic information, right? Is that enough to tell you where she would get into college? Absolutely not. Let's talk about her activities. She was an accomplished student leader at her school, very heavily involved in leadership. She loved it. She didn't do it to get into college. She actually loved it. It's really hard to do things for a long time just to get into college. And that shows on your college application. You do it because you love it, because it brings you some sort of meaning. So, loved leadership. She had significant community service and held multiple leadership roles within her community service activities. She worked. She worked at Baskin Robbins. She had to work. Her parents needed her to work. And she was working between 10 to 20 hours per week, depending on what time of year it was for her. Learned some very important traits there. She had to be responsible. She got yelled at by customers. And you know what? That taught her to be resilient. And she had to be you know, responsible to her boss, who sometimes wasn't the nicest. That taught her some really incredible life skills. She did a summer leadership program, and for this program, she actually went to Nicaragua, was doing a lot of community service there, was also meeting with several business leaders. It was an expensive endeavor for her to go on. So you know what? She did car washes, and to raise that money so that she could go, because her family literally couldn't afford to send her. There were some other students at her school that also wanted to go. 
She did fundraisers to help them to be able to go on this trip. After she went on this trip, she came back and started a club at her school relative to this activity that she did. So really very excited about the things that she was doing. Next page. Okay, so now this is where she applied. Very specifically, she applied to all the ECs. I just only listed the ones that were her priorities. She applied to all the ECs. Her top, cho cho top choices were Berkeley, LA, San Diego, Davis, Santa Cruz. Uh, sorry, um, and USC, not Santa Cruz, USC. Um, she had the potential of getting some pretty good scholarship there. And then decided, I'm going to take my hand and apply to a couple of top schools. Harvard, Stanford, Yale. This is her entire college list, except for the fact that she added all of the UCs. Her entire college list. Anybody want to guess where she got in? Okay, I'll we'll raise your hands. Who thinks she got into Berkeley? Okay, who thinks she got into UCLA? Who thinks she got into San Diego? She did not do well in your guys' eyes. Um, USC? Harvard? Stanford? Yale? Yeah. Okay, next, next page. She got into everywhere except for Stanford Yale. She got into Harvard with a 2,000 on her SAT, with a 3.88. She didn't have straight A's. If you look at her courses, they weren't the hardest courses at her school. She did what was manageable for her, but her extracurricular involvement was stellar. Her letters of recommendations were stellar. She got into Harvard, she talked to her admissions officer. Why did you admit me? She literally, that was her question, why did you admit me? And her admissions officer said to her, you went to a competitive high school. You had really good grades. We knew you were gonna be successful on campus. You had good test scores. We weren't worried about it. Your activities were amazing. Your letters spoke about how nice you are. And several letters of recommendations don't say that. They'll say like what a good student they are, how nice you are. It's an important life skill, important life quality. Next page. She attended Harvard, and she is now doing her finishing her summer internship at Global at Goldman Sachs in investment banking. She stayed true to her path, and that changes. So I want to talk about the general application factors viewed, really focusing on one though. So the first is academics. You've heard everybody say here academics are important. Academics are king, and so don't think that you can't have good grades and get into a good college. Next, testing. Testing is not going away, but testing is a way that colleges equalize across the board. It's only a 5% predictor in college success. So you have to do it, but it's not going away. I'm gonna run through because I'm running out of time. Academic, um, extracurricular activities. Tell us what you're gonna present on campus, how you're gonna get involved. Letters of recommendations I talked about are so important in terms of talking about who you are gonna to bring to the classroom setting and to the campus. These are demographics. You can't control where you go to high school, what background you are, etc. Colleges are definitely looking at this. This is about special academic interests. Letter, um, research papers that you're writing, anything that shows an academic interest. It could be poetry that you're submitting somewhere. College essays, we know why they're important. You're telling a story. And I want to get to this part less right here. Next one. It's about, this is the non-cognitive factors. This is the really important part. Colleges want to know that you have a love of learning. You can overcome adversity. You have cross-cultural engagement. A demonstrated interest in helping other people. You have leadership. That leadership, by the way, doesn't just have to be in the community. It could be in your home. It could be at the school. It could be watching your little siblings, younger siblings. Colleges are paying huge attention to this. This is what needs to come across in the rest of your application, not just in your letters and essays. The whole application has to show this. Okay, my time is up. I get the big stop sign. I will be at the back to answer any questions that you might have. So when I, when I hear poor we, you know, the key takeaway I'm hearing is basically a genuine application. You know? Having a genuine application that is telling a good story. Right? The fact that this candidate was portrayed as somebody who was very nice, that made her story stand out compared to a lot of other folks, right? So make it, make it your own very specific application. You don't have to follow the herd. That's what I, I was hearing and I told you your time. Okay, and last but not the least, let's give it up for Priya Pulu. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm coming out here today. Uh, I picked the topic of test optional schools today. Many of you might have heard of this, 
But before that, let me introduce myself. I, I think most of you have seen me around here. I volunteer and help kids during the college application season. I volunteer at public schools too to help, you know, especially during the college applications, they need extra help. So we go out there and volunteer at the, as to the one school I go to is Logan High School in Fremont, Union City. And I have an independent practice too where I help kids through the entire college admissions process. Uh, but it's especially enriching to help kids who really uh, lack facilities and who do not uh, have the help uh, to go through this process. And I would really like to be there to help them. Uh, today, I'll spend a little time talking about test optional schools. Um, when we think of test optional schools, this means that students do not need to send in their scores. When it's optional, it means to, uh, you do not have to send in your SAT or ACT scores. But then, when we think about this, there are more than 850 colleges which are test optional right now, and this number keeps growing day by day. But more than 50% of them are liberal arts schools. And I know we, we, when we talk about this, uh, in the Bay Area, students are targeting UC schools, and these schools require, let me never try to mince words, they do need your test scores, ACT, ACT scores, are the most important for these schools. But then, there are other schools which use words like test flexible or text blind. There's only one school as of today, which is the Hampshire College, which does not require any test scores. They take you for who you are and what you're going to bring to their school for their unique talent that you have. And when they mean test flexible, they are willing to accept scores that might be any standardized test scores that you have. Your AP exams might be those scores or you know the IB scores. Anything would be acceptable for these scores, uh, for these schools. So moving on. Uh, I would, like I said earlier, these are the schools, the top Ivy League schools and the UC schools will require you to send in your scores, so we should never forget about that. And uh, why do, now I would like to, you know, present in front of you two sides of the story. Why do colleges want to go test optional? When we think of colleges going test optional, they, it's not like they're angels and it's all for the good. There is a whole system behind it. Um, primarily, the colleges want to increase the number of applicants to their school. And the moment they become test um, optional, they look good in, on paper, on the, you, the rankings for all colleges. They, they look good on, uh, to everybody. So they become dear to uh, most people when you know, as soon as you know they're test optional, people you know, are very happy about it. But the darker side of this is that the acceptance rates come down. It leads to disappointment among students because of the selectivity going higher up there. Wake Forest is one of them. The top selective schools are now test optional. So this is the other side of the story that you all need to know. But then, um, I would think uh, the reasons why, for the noble reasons, they started off as a movement for noble reasons because they wanted students that were underrepresented and, and it's historically known that kids coming from a minority or a lower income background do not have access to the testing skills that are now available to everybody and you spend a lot of money on all of this. So a student can be coached to do well. Uh, this is kind of, it comes out as a disadvantage to schools. So if, if you did, if you took out that from the equation, you see kids as equal, then uh, it gives them a better opportunity to look at the kid for who or he or she is. So moving on, there is, uh, there is another interesting fact I don't want to take time, which is that the GPA that was measured at the end of the graduation for either kids who took tests or did not take was marginally different. So it didn't really make a difference if you, uh, you know, tested or not. And uh, it has been seen and uh, noted that SAT scores are only, you know, going to tell a college if they're going to do well in the first year of college. And beyond that, it's, a, it's you know, the various other experiences that they would have. So talking about why should a student pick up a school which is test optional. It could be that, you know, the test course is, does not measure up to your GPA. You could be having a great GPA, but you, you were test anxious, you had anxiety while taking the test, you're a poor test taker, and you just bombed on this test time and again, and no amount of testing is going to improve that. And so you think about what my options are, and you know, you try to highlight the other parts of your application, which could be as stellar as essays, like the panel mentioned before, or you know, a good recommendation that was it's exemplary community service. Any of these would help uh, your applications make it stronger and look better. 
Uh, moving on, uh, what then should I do to get into these schools? Like just as we think of schools that are dream schools, the read schools, target schools, why not add in to the mix of the list schools that are test optional? It's worth it to add a couple of them on there so you can understand, go to each of these websites of the schools that you're targeting and try to understand what the requirements for each of these are and they could vary from school to school. For example, New York University has seven essays that you need to submit in lieu of the SAT or ACT. So just similar to that, you have various different schools, some could have three, some could have seven. So just keep looking out and see what it is that each school needs. And Besides these, if you have recommendation letters or you know any other community service or research that you have presented someplace, it's good to have that on your application. Making your the holistic review or your application are really uh, you know it's it's it looks strong for uh, as a strong applicant. Moving on, one more. Um, uh, yes, I think it was um, yeah, it was about. Uh, the pros and cons, let's just put it this way. What are the pros and cons of getting in? You have a wider menu of schools that you could apply to. Once you get in the pros for uh, test optional schools, the number of schools, as I mentioned, are 850 liberal, maybe most of them are liberal arts schools, but the state schools are no less. California state systems are test optional. So you can remember that you get a quality education while you're staying close to home and for a lesser price. And the benefit of studying, uh, yeah, like I said, the cons would be uh, you don't get disappointed. Bottom line, you know, you're not in that big, uh, the selectivity, uh, you know, doesn't come, you know, in, in the, and it leads to disappointment for you because acceptance rate drops as you go into one of these selective schools. And you have higher expectations to perform because um, the schools would have conditionally accepted you maybe and you have to work hard through the year to prove that you really have to be there. And uh, the cost at uh, George Washington University, for example, the ticket price would be uh, seventy thousand dollars, sixty to seventy thousand dollars, and that includes room and board. So even if you did get into a test optional college, it is too expensive and prohibitive for any of anybody. I mean, if you wouldn't want to do that, you'd rather study in a state school that's closer to home. Lastly, if you have any questions related to this, feel free to email me or I'll be asked, or you can stop by and speak with me one on one today. Thank you so much. that you could look into. Thank you. Okay, let's give it up one more time to our amazing panelists. Great job. And, and hopefully it was sparking some thought in your head, you know, perhaps an aha moment. And that's the value a good counselor can provide you. Because they are providing insight based upon hundreds and hundreds of applications that they have gone through, compared to one or two that we'll probably run through in our lives. So they provide incredible insights. The fact that you could think of applying to test optional schools, I mean, that would never ever cross my mind. So, uh, you know, interesting insights, something for you to grab and perhaps uh, leverage as uh, your child applies to school. So at this point, uh, we'd love to uh, get a few list of questions and we'll run through the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, we'll run through this for about uh, 25 minutes, all the way to like 4.30. And, uh, Different mic? This, you can't hear very well with this mic? No. Okay, so the first question, we'll start with... Uh, uh, the order was basically decided in the order in which they signed up to be a panelist. So that's how we did it. But now we'll mix it up a little bit. And uh, the very first question I had... So, this is about turning the tide. We are familiar with turning the tide? Okay, so uh, how, if at all, will turning the tide affect college applicants in the next one to two years? And that's like in the immediate horizon. We'll start with Purvi. Not really at all. Um, you know, the focus that this article has brought out around community service, it's something that colleges have always been looking at. This New York Times article actually spun the, if you read the actual research paper done by Harvard, it's, it was spun completely differently by the New York Times. Colleges have always been looking for meaningful extracurricular involvement, meaningful opportunity to give back to any community that you are a part of. So while I have, I have heard so many more kids coming in, I want to do community service, I need you to get college, it's more about, well, you need to do things that are meaningful to you, and that's not changing. So how college admissions officers are going to be looking at this, 
It's not going to be any different this year or next year or what it was 10 years ago and what it's going to be 10 years from now. They're looking for what you contribute uniquely to the school, whether that be community service or whether that be anything else. And uh, I have a question for Pam, Pam Miracle. And this is, uh, you know, Pam, you mentioned don't use same essay for every school. But the Common App has a, has a common uh, essay. Are you saying edit it for each individual school? No, and I'm sorry for the confusion, but um, if you aren't already aware, when most students apply to about a dozen schools these days, they apply to reach schools, to target schools, safety schools, and in addition to the application essay question that you will write for the Common App, each one of those schools will have their own essays that you need to write. So in all, most of the students are writing somewhere around two dozen essays, if not more than that, because there are also a lot of short answer questions. It's a big temptation to write a template, you know, sort of a standard little piece, and cut and paste it into all sorts of different schools, because that's easy and it's a time saver. But that doesn't really benefit you, because every school may be looking for a slightly different take on an essay, and the temptation to do that also means that you may not be reading the question entirely, and if you don't read the question, you're not gonna answer it specifically, look, uh, answering and giving the information they're looking for, so that's what I meant by don't use the same essay for every school. Go to Sherry, and the question is, uh, the new SAT versus the ACT, now given the fact that SAT is new, a new SAT, should we go with SAT or with ACT? Good question, depends on who you are. <laughs> um, really, I mean... You might read the question again. Reading the question again? Oh, okay, so um, based on the changing SAT, the, the scale and, and the fact that it is kind of in process, it's, it's changing, um, well, it's changed, uh, versus taking the ACT that's been established and, and really, um, uh, schools have a baseline for the, the ACT versus like where's the baseline with the new SAT. Um, a lot of students are thinking that, you know, ACT makes most sense, but really you have to look at what the ACT and SAT are testing and how that matches your strengths or weaknesses. Um, I always advise students that are asking me this question, you have to start with a practice test. Um, and the more kind of I'm able to get to know your strengths and weaknesses inside of the classroom, um, we're able to predict, okay, what's the better test for you based on what you can bring to the test. Um, that being said, I mean, the SAT, the new SAT is moving closer, in my opinion, as a public school person that have been there for 11 years, they're moving closer towards the ACT, which is a curriculum-based exam. ACT is testing for what your students are learning in the classroom, and SAT, the new revision of that, is moving closer towards that. Um, so they're, in my opinion, they're, uh, and, and going to tons of college board, um, very kind of boring, uh, seminars on this topic, um, they, it sounds like that's what they're moving towards. Um, and it'll be an interesting uh, couple years of looking at admissions and having, having colleges establish their baseline for the new SAT. But in general, it depends on who you are. <laughs> and uh, John. So for John, the question is about, uh, about uh, AP courses in uh, specific to UC Berkeley or UCLA. So how many AP courses should we take? I love that question. Um, I graduated from Berkeley. Um, I hated Berkeley. So let's start there. Um, it really depends. Let's think about big picture who these people are. There are a whole bunch. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to start offending people. Right? That's kind of what I do. Uh, we got a whole bunch of admissions people who are you know, really smart, passionate, education-loving people. Oftentimes they're liberal arts majors. right? They really love their school or you know, they it's kind of a transition job uh, before they figure out maybe some more graduate school, something like that. So they want to see who do they think would come to their school and maybe be friends with them. I know it sounds horrible. Uh, right now I'm at USC getting my master's and uh, two of my classmates are USC admissions officers, so I, mean, I pick their brains all the time. I live in Los Angeles and I travel to all the universities at Pomona, UCLA. I love talking to admissions officers because they're just, they're human beings. So I try to understand their psychology to kind of 
break the code. But in terms of the number of APs, you're being judged against who's in your high school. So my question is, what is the average number of APs taken by students in your high school? Or what are the average number of APs taken by students from your high school that got into that specific university? So I can't tell you it's like five, 13. I, I met a kid, wow, 20? Yeah, he got to Stanford, which was a weird thing though. Um, he, I don't know if you guys heard, Stanford allowed people to look at their applications after they got in a couple years ago. There was some, you know, and so one of my students got in and she befriended this guy and they were judging him on academics. And even though he had 20 APs, he got two Bs. And I forgot what the scale was. If like one was great and five was bad, they gave him like a three in average. So even though he had 20 APs, because of the two Bs, they didn't consider him an academic superstar. But he still got in for other reasons. So if you guys are engineers, how many of you are engineers? Yeah, I said to Kemi for a long time. You want a formula, you want something quantitative. But these are human beings. It's like trying to go on a date. I can't give you a formula about this is what you do, this is what you say. What we try to do, I think what you've heard up here, we try to understand your student so that way we can understand what is the most powerful feature of that student that we can pull out and hopefully convince to the college that they can be a great attribute to the community. Okay, the next question is for Priya. And, uh, what tip uh, do you have, Priya, for people in high school, for kids in high school who haven't decided upon their major? I would ask them to start thinking right now because given that all campuses are impacted and it's harder and harder to get in, it's better to have a rough idea about where you want to go. You might have some flexibility in moving between schools, but even that is hard these days. So you must have that decided. Probably take, you know, you work hard over the summer or sometimes just think and deeply about what is it that you want to do because it's not it's senior year would not be the time to think about that because you your plate is going to be full of things that you need to do. And uh, the other question uh, what I see here, interesting one, is how do you juggle between uh, academics and extracurricular activities? How do you uh, give a sense of priority to either? Yeah, this is a really important question on a year by year basis and it changes throughout the year. So you really want to think about your whole year when you're planning your academics. Is that the key, kind of like how John was talking about, with, this is part of it is choosing the number of APs. You want to pick the right balance of classes where you know that you're going to be successful, but yet you're still challenging yourself. At the same time, you take into consideration what are those other things you're excited about. Well, I know that I want to play tennis, and that's at the beginning of the year. Okay, that's when I'm going to have, you know, maybe my SAT, and maybe I want to do speech and debate. Well, that's going to start to kick off in November, and it's going to be really busy during the spring. Okay, but I'm going to have these other things going on. So when you think about your year, I, I give this analogy that when you go to a restaurant and you're really hungry, you order a bunch of food, and it comes in front of you, and you're like, ah, what am I going to do? This is different, it's for a whole year. So plan out the whole year with your activities. And at some point you do have to prioritize. Ninth and 10th grade, I say it's really time to explore. Try a bunch of different things. Try in 9th grade, try in 10th grade. And then by at that point you hopefully can decide where you want to spend more time for 11th grade and 12th grade. Get more involved, get more leadership. But balance that with academics. Because remember, we've talked about academics are king. So extracurriculars don't supersede academics unless you're like, six foot three and you're going to play basketball or you can catch a football really well, academics are king. And so unless that's in place, everything else almost doesn't matter, to be honest. So make sure you can do academically. It doesn't mean take 20 APs and, you know, not do well and not do activities. Finding that thing, the balance for you is important. Yeah. So to summarize, drink your milk and get good grades. <laughs> and grow three Yes, exactly. Okay, too. <laughs> okay. The next question is, uh, after the title of the book, what are the benefits of EA slash ED versus regular admissions? We can write a book on this, right? So we have two minutes for Pam to respond to this. <laughs> um, maybe I'll even go faster than that. The biggest benefit is that admission statistics are higher for EA ED. So if you have a particular school that you're very interested in, it behooves you to apply early or under one of those programs because you're going to have a better chance of getting in. And that's, I mean, this is the other benefit of EAED is that um, it allows you to be a little bit more selective in, in where you're applying. 
there are a lot of restrictions that go along with it too, and that's going to take a lot longer than two minutes. But perhaps somebody would like to add. Specify what's EA and ED. EA is early action, and ED is early decision. Early action is non-binding. Um, early decision is a binding contract that you put in between you and the college. And so, like she said, it's your admission statistics go up when you're committing to a college. I'm, I'm getting my application in early, and I'm committed to go there if you accept me. Um, I think we covered it pretty well. I think the other advantage um, is really uh, for what we heard um, in conversations with colleges around here, specifically Stanford, I'll say it. Uh, early action and early, early decision um, is your time to capitalize on are you a legacy? Does your mom work there? Um, things like that. You're, you're um, encouraged to apply early to, to show this college, you're my number one choice, and I'm committed to go if you accept. It's, it's a very complicated question, and I think it's a very individual answer. So statistically, yes, ED does show higher admissions statistics uh, numbers. However, EA is starting to have diminished um, probability of getting in now because so many kids are applying to EA, and colleges can't predict their yield. Yield is the number one important factor for colleges because they want to know if we give 100 offers of admissions, we want to get 100 offers accepted. And so now they're saying with EA, we can't predict as well, so we're not going to accept as many in EA round. We need to save room for the regular round. Early decision also, you know, again, it's very complicated, but one thing is the financial element. When you do ED, your opportunity to get merit-based aid is going to drastically go down, meaning zero probably. So you're very not likely to get money. You're going to pay full cost. Think about that compared to the other schools that you're applying to because now you're committing to a school where you might have to pay 60, 65, but you might have chosen a UC that's at 35 or another school. So again, it's a very individualized, personal decision. Please just don't look at the admission statistics and say, oh, it works for me. There's, there's so much complexity that goes with it. So the answer to that was it depends. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, take the free up. And for Priya, the question was, uh, yes. So, you know, taking the lower level classes versus taking the real job classes, you know, and uh, getting good grades in the lower level classes versus actually just taking uh, higher level classes, AP classes, and maybe not getting as good grades. So how do you balance that out? Uh, what's the choice? AP classes, if you plan to uh, take more than, you know, a, a heavy load of them and you bomb on them or you're getting C's or B's, that doesn't hold up too well on your application. But, uh, but your basic uh, go, scores from your regular classes that you would have, you need to have an a, a and a B. I mean, if you're targeting the bigger schools, you need to have all of those check marked and doing well on all of them. So I would think, think twice before you take on these AP classes. If you're not going to do well it's, and struggling with them, you're better off with just a regular load of classes because after all, they're just looking at your transcripts, your high school, how you fared well at, at your school. I hope that answers the question. We go to Pam, and this is about essay. And uh, the question is, uh, who are the folks who read these essays? Who are these people? Are they, are they robots or they're some the, AI they're, they're that uh, perhaps readers. Nisha has created? <laughs> who knows? Who are the admissions readers that John talked about? <laughs> Um, who are they? Uh, they are admissions readers. Uh, every school, as you know, during a crunch period will hire on a lot of um, additional readers to read through all the applications that they receive. Most of them, as John said, tend to be graduates of the school because they have an affinity for the school, because they know the school, because they know what the school is looking for in terms of a good student and the kind of student they want to be a part of the student body. They tend to be 75% women, and uh, they also tend to be sort of in the age group of like 30 to 50. That's the majority of them. So when you're writing an essay, you also need to think about who that audience is. When you think about the fact that these are people who've gone to the university and that they're very involved in the university and very pro the university, one of the things that helps you to write a better essay is to go on the university website. See how they talk about themselves. See the words that they use to describe themselves. And see if you can find a way to mirror 
that in your essays because this is what they're looking for. They're looking for someone who shares their values. Um, the other thing you get from going on the website is a feeling, is letting them know if you sign up to get their, their literature and their, um, their admissions materials that you are interested in the college. So keep that in mind. Also, when you're looking at these people, who they are, they're not your age group. They're not in high school. So if you start making references to your favorite movies, singers, <laughs> YouTube videos, etc., etc., they will have no idea what you're talking about. And it's a waste of a lot of very valuable word space. So again, keep in mind who these people are and write in a way that they will find um, appealing. Okay, the next question is about transition from a local community college to a UC. Who, who wants to take that? Okay, we'll go to John. And uh, so please talk about uh, two, two aspects to this question. One is, should we look at an option of going through a two-year community college and then transferring to a UC? And then uh, how exactly does that transition happen, right? The reason I want to answer this is because I was a product of that system. So um, I went to Yanza College, a little bit different though, started at the age of 11. <laughs> so uh, I went after school, and then I went to Monta Vista, and I still went to Yanza yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Monta Vista. And then I, I had to pay for my own way through college, so I actually went to Yanza for two more years after I graduated from Monta Vista. I was very focused on the UCs, right? So I applied to Berkeley, LA, all the standard. And it's actually super easy, I'm sorry to say, it's super easy to get into the UCs or CSUs from the community colleges. They want to give you priority, right? This is state funded. They, they need to move you through the system. So the average GPA will be substantially lower. They don't look at any um, standardized test scores. Please consider that. Uh, from my point of view, actually I transferred to the, sorry, I transferred to the University of Pennsylvania. So you can get into an Ivy League school from De Anza. It's not that common. One girl got into Stanford, I got into Penn, I had some friends that went to Johns Hopkins and stuff like that. I ultimately later helped somebody go from De Anza to Wharton. I think that only happened once. So the good thing about De Anza, you save so much money. For students that are late bloomers, they need a couple more years. Not everybody turns 18 and becomes an adult, right? It's great to be at home. Let's talk about the downside. I actually would not let my child go through that process, even though I went through it. Because I missed out on that fun freshman year of being in the dorm and building that network of friends. And I transferred twice, so into Penn and then to Berkeley. And so I end up having a lot of very loose connections, but not as many deep connections that I saw that my friends had who spent four years at a university. And we'll keep it there. We'll keep it there. Uh, the, the next question was, uh, for this might apply to private uh, colleges, what role do alumni or other interviews play in the admission process and how do you prep for such types of interviews? Uh, it depends on each school, so I actually just recently talked to Harvey Mudd, um, it's a liberal arts school but a technical school, and they are so desperate for alumni. The guy said, there was this kid who applied, he was the first second generation legacy, so his grandfather went to Harvey Mudd, and he's like, you know, we had to just keep looking at his application because he was the very first one. Uh, so Harvey Mudd kind of gave away that it matters a lot. At other schools, especially public schools, there's no wait. Um, one of my students who applied, dad went to Penn, so she was considering applying to Penn. Penn specifically went to the dad and said, if your daughter doesn't apply early, right, it's not going to have that much value. So it kind of depends on each school. If you have legacy, mom, dad, go make some phone calls. All right, do not be afraid. And it's not about like donating money, even though that can help. Um, Penn told uh, one of my students' parents, oh, because he's a banker, right? He's a managing director for a major Wall Street firm. He constantly goes back to Warren and recruits. They love that. If they make his family happy, hey, guess what? You know, his major investment bank will go back to Warren. So there's different ways besides donating money to make the school look at your child like uh, a little bit closer. Leave it right there, and we'll run through, this is the final question. And, uh, you know, basically, it's uh, providing some perspective in terms of uh, experience and uh, some other factors that might be relevant for you as you decide who you would like to pick as a college counselor, for example. So the question is, uh, can each of you talk about, and if we can keep it to a minute, you know, probably it'll be less than a minute, but can each of you talk about statistics or results? So how many kids have you counseled in the last two years? And, uh, and you don't have to answer everything, you can answer it as you feel. 
and also the percentage acceptances at the UCs based upon the number of kids you counsel and at private schools and at IED. So it's a very, very specific question, but I think it's relevant to, to our audience. So the last two years, I actually probably- I'm sorry, John, just one second uh, before we get going. Uh, this, this is the last question. And at that point, I think we have uh, Monica Goyal here. And uh, Monica Goyal is going to uh, draw out uh, 25, uh, a list of 25. And uh, so after this questions are answered, we will actually pull the chairs out. I really appreciate the help of the parents for putting the chairs away. And we'll use those desks at the back end for the counseling session. We'll start the counseling session at the end of this last question. And uh, we'll run through all the way to 510. And at 510, we'll, uh, we'll terminate the counseling session. So how we'll do it, once again, just to clarify, we'll pick out 25 names, and uh, we'll, be, le we'll let you pick wherever you would like to go to. But in case one of the tables already have five, they are standing in line, then you'll be routed to the next one. So initially, you'll get to pick which counselor you would like to go to. But as they get uh, populated, we'll, we'll route you to a different table, if that's OK. And uh, we'll invite my wife, Seema. She'll, uh, by Monica. Uh, do we have Karishma and uh, Ch Karishma Chadani here by any chance? Karishma and uh, Deepak? They are not here. Okay, question. How do we get a name in Ijidon when we sign up? Yes, you can actually, we have slips. Uh, happy to, uh, we'll give you another five minutes. Uh, fill up the slips. They are actually sitting at the table back there. And you can put them in this uh, box here. And, you know, obviously this is not the end, end of it all. You can actually have you can take business cards, you can schedule offline meetings, you have other opportunities to talk to some of these. And with that, we get started. This question sucks for me. Um, I probably only took on 10 students in the last two years. Um, I'm actually the trainer of all the counselors and instructors. So I oversee, I, two Mondays ago, I read over 80 college essays of our students, and I see a whole bunch of files, but I personally don't take on a lot of students. But to brag about myself, two years ago, I got somebody with a 3.7, three AP classes, 2200, early admission standard. Okay, um, hold a lot of strings. Um, we got somebody who was not top 10% at Monta Vista, right, into Chicago. Yeah, I was really happy about that. I got a kid from Monta Vista who did not apply early to Penn, but Penn gave him an early, uh, not early decision, but they gave it to him two months early. Right, so again, there's different ways. Um, I think we're all probably pretty good. My biggest thing, I assume, I don't know, but my, uh, the biggest thing, especially for parents, a lot of parents will actually choose to work with me because me and the parent will, like, will hit it off because I was a tech entrepreneur for a long time, love talking tech. That's not the right choice. If your student doesn't get along with us, like, what's the point? I'm, you're not paying me to be your friend. Right? We're trying to pay me to help you connect with each other. Good point. This question sucks even worse for me. I'll tell you why. I've been in public schools for 11 years, so how many students have I worked with over the past two years getting into college? Unfortunately, about 200. Um, so this is actually my first year officially with UC Easy, um, and part of my frustration working at public schools are not being able to go in depth with families and individuals and individualizing the process. So I'm working part-time at, at Sequoia because I can't let go of my first-generation college students. So if you look at my statistics of getting those types of students in, um, it's, it's pretty good. It's not as good as it was when I was at Monta Vista because the students were amazing. Um, but I, I think the, the reason why I, I want to work personally, one-on-one -on -one with students and families is really to dive deeper into the process and, and um, make it an individual process for families. And like John said, this is, um, I mean, you could pay me to be your friend, but that's not the point. So we're here talking and connecting and helping your student. Um, so yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to give you any statistics either. Uh, what I will tell you is go on our website, www.comestocollege.org. There is a list of all the colleges that we've gotten students into. There are letters of recommendation and nice things people have said about us. We've been in business for six years. Um, I will tell you that personally, I limit the number of students that I work with because it's an intensive job. And as um, everybody has said, it needs a good fit. It's all about getting the right, um, the right fit and the right understanding between a student and a counselor. 
And so I'm not really working with more than about, um, what, a dozen, 15 students at a time, because otherwise it's not fair to them, it's not fair to me. I can't give them the individual attention that they need. This question does not suck for me. <laughs> I like answering this question. Um, so we've been in business since 1999. I will take on a load of students. We have several other counselors that we work with that work with us as well. Um, and I do oversee all of counseling. I will have about 30 to 40 seniors year by year. And very honestly, I don't like answering the question about IVs and UCs and things like that, partly because not every kid wants to go to an IV. Not every kid wants to go to a UC. We have kids that walk in with a 2.0. I just kind of thought about college recently. I didn't think I wanted to go for a long time. And so we have this really broad range of kids that we are working with. And so I will tell you that when we help build out our college list, we make, we're making sure that it's really well balanced, where we have the dream schools on there, we have those target schools, we have the safety schools, we're realistic yet ambitious in how we build out our list, and so we're aspiring to get help every kid find the right choice for them. That being said, I know that there's a lot of people are numbers oriented here. Um, we have kids going to every single Ivy League this year. One of my kids emailed me yesterday, he's heading off to MIT. And I think that's something that's really important about the relationship that people are talking about. It's not just about come in, do your essay, leave. These kids sometimes are with us for four years, sometimes are with us for a year. They email me when they're in college. They come back when they're on vacation. And they come in, we have lunch, we go for coffee. They come back, for any help going to graduate school. Can you help me with that now? Absolutely, let's talk about what you've done while you were in college. So again, that relationship is really important. So when you're picking someone to work with, if you pick someone to work with, it's not just about college. Don't think about it just at one point. We're mentors to your kids. We're the ones that are dispelling all those myths. We're the ones that when they come, they're like, I'm so stressed out. They talk to us about that. They might not talk to you, but they talk to us about that. And sometimes I close out my computer. I'm like, let's just talk. Let's not talk about college. Tell me what's going on in your life. How can we fix that? How can we find solutions? And so, again, that relationship is really important. Uh, I'll divide this question into two parts because I have the public school side where I volunteer because I help kids make up their lists and help them do their essays and everything. And I rarely get to know where they went, you know, after the, the three months that I was at that school. But all the same, it's been an enriching experience helping them with this whole process. And I see kids going to different schools from the public schools where I volunteer. But in my personal practice that I have, I would like to say I'm very uh, personalized, just four to five students. I really like to get to know the students really well. I connect with them. And I, I, I really treasure the moments I have with them because the during the essays, especially when we're brainstorming, it's oftentimes the smaller things that they have forgotten. And when we're chatting and talking, they come up with wonderful essays within just half an hour of sitting with me and just chatting about something that they are passionate about. And I treasure these moments with them. So I would say I have to, my first kid went into UPenn and the last kid that I've helped went to UC San Diego. So it's a range in between. I have kids who went to community college too and are really happy doing what they're doing right now. So Rishi had to leave, so I get to take over. Um, <laughs> Thank you everyone, thanks for all the panelists for joining in and I really appreciate your thoughts and comments and feedback. Uh, so we're going to continue this uh, by, um, like Rishi mentioned, we're going to do these one-on-one -on -one sessions and 25 of you will be drawn in. Um, some parents have put in their names, some students have put in their names. So we are uh, just going to call out the names and for drawing this out, I'm going to invite Monica Goyle, who is representing um, Bill Gorman's group, who is our regular sponsor for these events. I see a lot of people leaving, so <laughs> I guess uh, people are not interested in the one-on-one -on -one session. But um, Monica, if you can come up here, um, instead of using the, yeah, just, uh, so we, we're going to draw 25 names over here, um, and uh, we're going to start with the first one. Asher Siddiqui. So you get to you get to pick which table, which counselor you want to go to. You can only go to one. Sure. Second one is Vishana Kai. Should we? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Shreya Khair. Uh, Judy Nega, I might be saying something wrong, please pardon me for that. Anish Sabu. Mandar Matkar. Abhinav uh, Potapua. Anjali Prabha. Gita Kunaparadi. Vipa Nichapani. So, uh, so far we have drawn out 10 names. So just make sure you are going only when, to a one table. And when we have five people on that table, then please go to another counselor. Thank you. Sarah Hazel. All right, Sarah, I see you smiling. Nira Ful Adunu. Sorry if I didn't say it right. Amy Elazia. Samuel Thakur. Fariha and Tulit. I'm sorry if I didn't say it right. Sorry. Manoj Tahilani. Jeevan Prakash, Kavya Ayer, Shashi Hadalkore, Varsha Horantu, Jay Wishwarpe Hardy Hagen Ranjan Goyal Daniel D'Souza Okay, so the last one is Anika Shah Thank you everyone. Um, uh, for those who uh, can help out, please help fold the chairs and stack them up on the racks. That would be really appreciated. Uh, we thank everyone for coming in and we'll see you guys soon.
Surveys stop this. 